All right. Good morning, everyone. How is the DevOps experience so far? Is it good, bad, anything up? Great. Yeah. Thank you, actually, for attending today. Um, let me introduce myself first. My name is Mari. I am a developer advocate, and I have... Hi, my name is Teemu, and I am a Vardin expert and a framework developer at Vardin. So, how many of you have heard about Vardin before? Raise your hands up. Yeah, that's an impressive number. Uh, just to recap really quickly, so Vardin is a Java UI framework. Our main goal is to make easy for you to build amazing web apps. Hey, hey, but we are not here to talk about Vardin, right? Yeah. Let's talk about technology in general. Today, we are more interested about how technology looks like. So back in time, we had this, like six years ago or something like that, we had this move toward the cloud. Nowadays, it's no longer an argument to convince somebody that your next web application should run on the cloud. That's just a default now. And also recently, it happened that web developers, enterprises, and decision makers realized that they also need to reach people on mobile devices. That's something that started to appear recently, and I think uh, most people now believe that reaching more audience, we need to be able to have a handheld friendly website or mobile app. But the question is how the future will look like after this, how the near future will be shaped. Actually, statistics and those kind of uh, a little bit old statistics, two years old or something like that, we noticed that the internet traffic coming from mobile devices exceeded this coming from desktop devices. That's why we need to take a decision here. We need to take action. Those of you who are building web applications for desktop need to take an action. But the confusion is, most of you have in your offices nice display, big screen, you're using heavy software for coding or video editing or photo editing and so on. You have high powerful processor and moreover, you have high stable connected internet. So having this mindset in my hand and having this as my daily job, whenever I go to my job, I have to use a laptop that is powerful with powerful processor and having a reliable internet makes me wonder how come people are increasingly using mobile devices? This just doesn't work with me as a developer. The answer is most of you Temo, myself, we are a content producer. A content producer is a person, like most of you probably, who is building a software, or building a web application, or building maybe even article on the internet. Most of our time is spent on a laptop, a powerful device. But we need to make a differentiation here between the mindset of us, the content producers, and the rest of the world. In other words, in your next web application, which audience you want to reach? Is it this little orange portion or the blue portion? Don't do like us. We are a framework people. We are targeting the orange part most of the time. But we are striving to make our framework able to make you, as a developer, reach the blue part. That's why we need to rethink about our web development strategy. A lot of research, a lot of statistics, and I can share from you, with you some big trends. For example, those statistics show that the number of users who are using mobile web is only 13%. So even though there is a lot of effort of making web, mobile web applications look good, still the portion is a little bit small. And the interesting part is those of 87% people who are using native apps, only 80% of their time is spent on only three apps. So I'm looking at myself. I have almost like, I don't know, 200 apps on my mobile device, but still I'm only spending most of my time on only three apps. So there is some, something missing here, right? Actually, this chart shows it correctly. We have a web application that is guaranteed to be up to date all the time. 
It has the latest feature and it's connecting with the latest server and latest database and everything. But it's missing capabilities. That's why native apps are emerging. People prefer native apps or apps installed from the marketplace because they have native capabilities. So another, another interesting statistic show that the number of apps installed, let, let me ask this, how, how many of you actually remember installing uh, an app within the last two weeks or one month, for example? Uh, oh, by the way, uh, DevOps app does not count. <laughs> <laughs> actually, statistics show that the number of apps installed from the marketplace per user per month is zero. I don't remember installing any app, except of course it's DevOps, but I don't remember installing any apps recently. I have like tons of apps, and more annoyingly, I have this notification that keeps popping up and telling me, hey, update your app. Every second day, update your app. So let's, let's think about it. I have 200 apps on my mobile device. I am only using three of them, but still I'm getting those updates. Hey, update this app and update this app. And this is a cringe shot, not mine, but anyway. <laughs> so what is... What is the story here? To fix this, we need to take a look at this chart one more time and probably adding more capabilities to the mobile, app, mobile web app will make it more appealing for users to use it. We've done a lot of research, not us only, but many companies, many big players in the market. They have done a lot of researches to show off what are the capabilities that we can do here. Uh, that's why Google, for example, came up with yet another acronym called PWA. PWA stands for Progressive Web App. It's an approach where if you build a PWA app, you are moving toward better app that will be more reusable, which means that having web workers in your app, offline support, push support, and so on. Now, now that I listen to the list that you just said, the push notifications and stuff, I at least noticed that I'm doing this on a daily basis with the framework, and I guess most of you have to do some of these things every single day. Exactly. PWA, or Progressive Web App, is actually just a hype word. It's not a standard or anything. Maybe it will be standard or maybe not. We don't know. But it's just a way of listing capabilities that if you are following them, then you will have a progressive web app that hopefully will be more engaging with your users. So let's take a look on how to build a progressive web app. But before starting, uh, how about we take a look first about the current state of an application. For example, can we build a Java app, for example, right now and see how it looks like? OK, finally something for me to do. <laughs> I've been waiting for this. so. I'm just going to go here and open up my Eclipse. Switch uh, screen. Switch the screen. Oh, maybe. Yeah, the font is really small. Can you see it? Definitely not. Um, maybe I need to switch how my displays are shown or increase the font size. Ah, demo effect. Preferences. Font. Uh, I just need to increase this. Yeah, I think. That should be big enough. Nothing. No. No, no, no. That was the wrong I setting. Think, I think the idea is is clear, so maybe we can <coughs> keep going. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's close enough. So uh, I have here a Spring Boot application, or, or actually a Spring Boot backend, that is using this thing called uh, Workout. This is my basic Bojo. It cons contains information of my sports activities, like how long did it take, how many calories did I burn, what kind of sport I was doing, and when did I do it. So this is a basic, just, I'm just going to make here a basic data view of the things that I have in my backend. Right. And because I'm not Josh Long, I cannot actually go and talk at the same time. So I'm going to need you to do something for me. Okay. So probably you're now defining um, 
a new UI for your application. So I, I can see this application is already running. How it look like right now? Right now. Oh. It looks like a white label error page. Okay, so it's not working. It's it's like showing an error page because there is no UI. So that's why probably he decided to start to create um, UI. He's calling it sport sports tra tracker UI tracker. Yeah. And I need a, a data grid to display the data. Yeah. And I'm going to need some data in there. So um, be an item container to uh, wrap the data from the back end and push it into the grid. And then set size full probably to make it occupy the whole screen and finally make it the root content of our application. And then some spring magic to actually get the repository. All right. So injecting the repository inside your application and populate it inside the grid as well. And are we ready? I think so. I'm just going to restart the application just to make sure that everything is updated. OK. Spring Boot starting up. And I should have here. Whoa, that was quick, actually. Data grid. All right. That looks nice. It was quick. But uh, yeah. do I have to use Spring? No, you can use CDI, you can use whatever Java libraries you'd like. You can, if you have figured out something awesome that we're not yet uh, using in our demos at Vaden, you can always tell us that, hey, here's this awesome thing. Please show me how to use it. OK, but the interesting part here is that uh, we want to know how much compatible this app with progressive web apps. So there is this Lighthouse extension demo that we have here. That you have been bugging me for two days. Yes, for the demo, I think. Yep. And this extension actually is available for Chrome. Uh, and it's by Google. It somehow kind of tell you or generate a report for you uh, to show you how much your app is compatible with uh, progressive web apps. Yeah, but you were actually talking something about offline support. Should we try to see how this application works in offline mode? Maybe, yeah, we can try that first. OK, I'm just going to kick up here, go to the network tab and click on offline. Do you think it's going to work offline? Uh, well, our Let's server see. connection lost. Just going to reload the page. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. My favorite game. Uh, OK, OK, stop. Let's not play now. Let's oh. just go back to the report generator. So please go back online. <laughs> OK. Just going to go back online. And let's, reload. let's try this Lighthouse. So Lighthouse is somehow generates a report for us uh, to see how much crap the app is compatible. OK. We are back online, and hopefully there is no uh, inspector okay. running anymore. So it's just doing some tests, making sure that it's, it looks nice on mobile, and uh, it works offline, apparently not. So what, what is the score? What's our score? <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, um, no. Yeah. 22. Is it a m demo effect? <laughs> Uh, I think not, because I think that we haven't included these features in Framework yet. Oh, OK. So it looks like the report here is telling us about um, why our app is not PWA compatible. And there are a lot of things to fix. So let's first take a look at what is actually PWA, what are the exact guidelines to build a progressive web app. So can we go back to the presentation? Sure, we can go back to the presentation. Uh, there you go. I actually summarized the building blocks for progressive web app into three important points. The first point is reli reliability. So reliability means that your app works offline. So even though Temu was very happy to see the little dinosaur, because probably he doesn't see it enough in his office, but we, we need to think about our users who are going to be really annoyed to see this little dinosaur when they are using our apps. So we don't want to show this at all. We need to give a response, a feedback at some point. We want to also make sure that the app is fast enough, which means that the initial response time of the app 
even just the initial skeleton of the UI need to be retrieved as quick as possible. Again, studies show that 40% of users would stop using the app once it takes more than three seconds to load. So this is an important metric that you need to take into consideration. Also, the third metric is engaging. Engaging in an op is a little bit open term here, and uh, I would say it contains a lot of things, how to make your app engaging enough, but I summarized the three most important stuff here, which is making it immersive. And immersive here means that the app shouldn't run inside a browser. The user doesn't want to see the address bar and the menu and so on. He just wants to see the app full screen. The theme, we need to also make sure that it look like a native, if it's not native already. And the orientation, so changing the orientation of the device should reflect to the app as well. For the home screen, it's a feature that is starting to be available in most of a browser right now where you can actually have an icon of the app on the home screen from where you can launch the app. Probably similar to the old school bookmark that is used to be in iPhone devices, but here we are talking about something a little bit more advanced. You click on the app, it opens in a full screen with a splash screen, it works natively. We're gonna see this a little bit later. Notifications. Notifications push support, it means, and probably we had push in many mobile apps since a long while right now, but what I'm talking about here is push through web workers. So you don't actually have an app installed on your device. I didn't go to Marketplace to install an app. I'm gonna have push through web workers without actually installing anything on the device. So those are probably the most three important uh, summarization for making your app engaging. And you can see, for example, here, uh, believe it or not, but I got those notifications without installing Air Berlin on my device. And on the other side here, United Airlines notifications coming from Google, and it's again without installing anything on my device. So a pure mobile experience without any app, yet I'm getting notification about important updates. So uh, what do you think, Temu? Do you think we can start implementing those things inside our Java application to make it more PoA friendly? Um, I think that if I take a look at some examples, I can sort of uh, borrow bits and pieces here and there and actually make a few hacks to get the pieces in place and actually get it up and running in a progressive web app friendly way. All right, let's see. Luckily, there are a lot of open source examples on how to get started with progressive web app uh, to create a template out of it. So do you have something? Running? Yeah, I actually did some homework beforehand and I actually have one already installed and up and running. So just gonna go back to the Chrome over here. Switch screen. Uh, yeah, switch screen. So people can actually see what I'm doing. Why are you not taking the full space? Okay, so in here I have a server running in port 3000 called non-Java progressive web app example. So actually this is a template retrieved from an open source project called Generator PWA, and it generates the basic stuff you need for creating a progressive web app enabled app. But hey, let's test it. Let's see how much it's compatible. Okay. So this should give us a sort of guideline on what we are trying to achieve, what kind of a score we need and, oh, really? So it's 79. Even though the score is not really high, but it's still on the green side. And if you scroll a little bit down, we can notice that the problem right now is actually the HTTPS side. Because I'm running on my local device right now, and I'm not installing the app on an HTTPS server, one of the aspects of having progressive web app is actually having it secure. So uh, that's only th the only reason why the score is a little bit lower than expected. But other than that, it looks like we are having all the things green. So please impress us. Show us how we can have that in our Java application. Okay, so I would assume that this, since this is basically just an HTML file and some JavaScript, that I can find some things in the source code. Okay. 
So copying from the source code. Copying from the source code. Uh, at least I can immediately tell that there's a viewport I included here. Uh, that is basically setting up some uh, settings for mobile devices so that they actually scale the page correctly. Okay. So I'm going to add this to the to my UI over here. I happen to know that we have this thing called viewport annotation that takes the string fixed import and that would be one step, but I'm pretty sure that this is not enough. So uh, you have been talking a lot about the service workers, mm -hmm. so we could try to take a look at those, how, how those are actually done. Okay, look like it's included down there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's this app.js that is providing the service worker. Yeah, it's, it's already talking so about this service worker. So this code is something that I, I'm going to directly borrow from them. Not so steal, but this code own. is basically the code responsible about registering a service worker inside the application. So after JS into the static folder, copy files. I'm pretty sure I need to modify some things here. Uh, at least I'm not going to build here the hierarchy. So I'm just going to have them in the same folder. And I'm going to need the service worker service worker the JS file as well. So I'm just going to copy that as well. Okay, and I can tell you that some of these things do not make any sense to a Vardin application. So I'm just going to so clean, those are clean the up cached a bit. files, and they are not relevant to us right now. Yeah, I'm just going to comment that one out because I have feeling that we might need it a bit later. So that would be the service worker, and then I need to somehow include it into the page. And this is not something that I can actually do like out of the box into the bootstrap page. So I'm going to need to do a little ugly hack here. Okay. But while I'm uh, once again doing some coding, you can entertain our customers here. Well, I'm not really good at entertaining, but maybe I can explain what he's doing right now. So basically, uh, because he decided to use Vaden application for obvious reasons, so uh, he uh, there is a default servlet provided by a Vaden application, and uh, he is trying now to modify the default servlet. The idea is we uh, want to serve some static files along with the default servlet that is provided by the Vaden application. So what he is doing right now is overriding the servlet initialized method, and then he's going to try to inject some extra headers inside the application. Those headers is basically to serve, at least for now, the JavaScript uh, service worker. So bootstrap listener to modify the bootstrap of the Vaden application, and then uh, modify the bootstrap by... I'm just going to put the script into the header. Okay. I know it's not the place where it was in the example, but I think that it's going to be close enough. Let's and see. And I'm going to need a piece of string from the index. Over there. And I think I need to escape those quotation marks and remove the folder structure semicolon at the end, and I am done. So basically, he modified the bootstrap of the application to include this extra step. And this extra script will register the service worker. So hopefully we now will have a service worker in our application, do we? So at least right now when I'm looking at the bootstrap page, it actu actually contains the uh, JavaScript part. Awesome. And there's the viewport part. So should we test it? I, th I think we should test it. Yeah. So let's see how much progress Temu managed to do. So Lighthouse again for testing the application. Uh, no, let's, let's see, see the report. So, yeah, I didn't see a dinosaur, sadly. Okay, look like offline also is now supported. All right, so 46. That's not bad. It's like, look like a work in progress. 
Maybe we can do something about that. What else is missing in this report? Yeah, the HTTPS, of course, because I don't have it running on yeah. HTTPS. Let's, let's not fix that at the moment. Let's look at the other problems. OK, so this is talking about a manifest file. So what, what is it? Basically, the manifest file is another file that you should include in your uh, progressive web app that provide information about how the icon that should be used, how the splash screen should be uh, should be uh, defined, the theme, the background color, and many other definitions. So having this manifest file is also another aspect of building a progressive web app. And having this manifest file is also the piece of code that will allow you to have this add to home screen functionality to your app. So can you please add it as well? So yeah, I found this uh, link rel equals manifest in the non-Java example. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to... Since I already have the structure here, it's going to be really easy. Just add yet another line to the header. Sounds like easy. Append and that one over there and some escapes. And we should have, well, of course, then we need the manifest JSON somewhere. So I guess that we will find it over here. Manifest JSON. We can actually take a look at the content of the manifest file to see exactly what I'm talking about. It's a JSON file that define the icons, the theme color, and so on. Uh, but probably we don't have all those icons yet in our static folder. So what, what can we do about it? Let's see if I can get it bigger on this screen. So yeah, it, it contains all, all kinds of irrelevant information. Uh, I think we need to modify this a bit. Um, we are going to I think we parts. don't have those icons yet. No. So adding those icons is also uh, important for our application. Okay, I'm just going to simplify it and just copy one of the icons. And okay, for the sake of this demo, since we are testing on Chrome only, maybe we can keep the Chrome icon for now. Yeah. But uh, of course, if you want to reach multiple browsers and multiple users, then keep the old icons and probably also keep multiple icon sizes. That's a good practice. But for now, let's just copy this piece of icon for now, the Chrome icon, and have it in our static folder uh, to be able to serve it as a progressive web app. So it's ready now. I think I, I have now all the pieces in there. I, I would say that we could also cache the image, just in That's case. That's a good idea. And we should be done. Let's restart and retry. I wonder what's what's up with my Eclipse. It's using weird colors, but I, I don't know. So in here again, session expired, Restarting. restart. Let's generate the report this time. OK, so now we should have one more piece of the puzzle in place. So, so while generating the report, we can notice that it actually started to work offline. No more dinosaur. Let's hope for a better result this time. Let's see. Whoa, that is a 76 out of 100. Actually, yes, that's a good number. What else are, are we missing? Do we miss maybe the shortcut name? HTTPS. No, everything else seems to be fine. So I guess that my application is loading a bit slow because there is, uh, for the Vardin application, there's this client-side piece, which is a bit bigger. I could optimize it to be smaller in size, or I could try to make the service worker actually cache it and so serve the same file from the local, uh, local cache instead of downloading it again. So probably because we're also in a development mode, our uh, application is not that fast right now, still Java yeah. application un, uh, uncompressed. But at least we have now a good green score uh, obviously, we can still work on this. We can add push support. We can add more pieces to make the application work. Talking about push, maybe it's not so easy. Yeah. <laughs> so switching to the presentation. So talking about push and all this home screen stuff, uh, let's uh, let's actually uh, see how this look like. So if you don't have access to the applications that Temu built right now, probably you have access to the Washington Post. If you open it right now inside your handheld device, you will, after some time of usage, you will find this 
little notification down there telling you add to home screen. If you click on it, then you will get a notification that the app has been added to your home screen. And then if you go to your home screen, you will find this little nice icon telling you that you now have an app in your home screen. We didn't go to App Store. We didn't go to Google Play. We didn't go to any kind of marketplace. We installed an app just by visiting it from the Chrome browser or any modern browser. Now to the next interesting part, when I click actually on this app, what will happen is you will see a splash screen showing that the app is getting loaded. And then when the app is loaded, you will notice immediately that it's not running inside the browser anymore. It's occupying the full screen, and it has almost native experience. So this is the idea. Now we have something similar to what we used to have a few years ago when desktop applications were moving to web and to cloud. We have now mobile applications that we realized that it's not really the best idea to make applications that need to be updated more and more. And now we can have them actually almost with offline support and uh, almost looking native. And that's not everything. Actually, if you go down there and click on the task switcher, you will notice that the app is actually out there as a standalone app. So this is something that has been a uh, work in progress since a while. Many vendors started to adopt it. As you can see, Washington Post and Air Berlin and many other uh, websites, maybe AliExpress as well, if you heard about it. Uh, so all of those kind of websites are now supporting this. And more websites are starting to move toward this more and more. Instead of installing an app from the marketplace, you can now have the app that you want on your home screen, no longer updates, no longer worrying about notifications, no longer worrying about having up, uh, out of the date application, and so on. So what Temu did right now was basically the lighthouse test. It's just some kind of uh, testing to know how much your application is actually compatible with a progressive web app. But I have one more experience for you a practical test, how to practically test that your application is progressive web app or is good for mobile users. I summarized those into uh, three steps. The first step is mobile first design. What does that mean? Basically, when we build our components at Vaden or when you build your next web application, put in mind that you are testing on mobile first. And that's it, which means that when you are building something, first of all, make sure that it works on a mobile device. When it's working fully on your mobile device and everything is good here, then you can go to the next step and see if it's compatible with desktop. So this is a little bit different than how we used to build apps nowadays when we are building it for desktop because this is the most available object right now. And then after that, we try to optimize it and cut pieces and make it shrink and make it look nicer on mobile devices. Let's switch the strategy. And this strategy has been adopted by big players again by actually having the app work on mobile device first. The, ne the next test strategy is called offline first design. Offline first design is similar to the mobile first design in which you actually test and assume that your application is going to work fully offline. So imagine that your next web application is going to be used as a desktop application, fully offline. Your user will reach your application for the first time ever, and that's it. Probably next updates and next iterations will happen on the background using web workers. So adopting this um, thinking of having offline first will give you a better user experience. Um, actually, I installed the Twitter progressive web app on my phone to, like two days ago. And they're offline because I'm abroad and my roaming doesn't actually work. So I hit the offline page every now and then when the Wi-Fi is going down. And actually, they are showing me a page that is telling me that I don't have connection to the internet right now. And I can try again later. Well, so even that is offline first 
Yeah, absolutely. So a Twitter application, of course, relies on being online all the time. It doesn't make sense to have Twitter offline, right? So having at least a response to the user telling him that this application can't do or perform this specific functionality right now is way better than a dinosaur. The third test or practical test that I have for you is actually a coffee first design. This is actually a name that I came up with. It's called the coffee first design, where you give your tester a mobile device running your app and a cup of coffee. And see if your user will be able to use all the functionality of your application without dropping the cup of coffee. So uh, basically, uh, maybe you can call it the thump first device, uh, thump first design, where you make sure that everything in your application is accessible within a thump holding the device. If the user has to go with the, the second finger and make zooming and click and zoom out and so on, then you have some problems in your user experience. Most of the users just want one thump to be able to navigate everywhere. So probably add those practical tests in your head when you are developing your next application. It will eventually increase your engagement and user experience. So that was all about the progressive web app. Uh, another standard that we know about is the web components, as actually. How many of you hear about web components? Of course, everyone hear about web components, right? So I don't need to go over the definition of what web components, because I, I feel that it becomes standard. When I was here last year, I was like still defini defining what is web component. But I think, I think everyone now realizes that it's just a standard now. Mo uh, Browser manufacturers started to adopt this, and we are starting to see more support and more, um, more progress toward that. Um, and we at Vaden also uh, started to think that having web components in a Java application or in whatever other application you are using is important. That's why we also, in our research lab, started to create web elements. So what is the idea? We've been in the market for almost 16 years now, and our components have uh, gained a lot of attention from uh, most of the developers. They really love our components, but they are not really web components. That's why we decided to extract them from the Java framework and make them available as a separate web component. If you go to our website, you'll find those uh, show highlighted components. They are mature and ready to use. Others are still in the lab. They are not listed yet. And we made them available for Polymer users, Angular users, React users, and pretty much any JavaScript user. So the idea here is that we are making our components, we are abstracting ourselves from just making our components for Java developers only, and we're making them available for pretty much any user over here. So I'm going to use it that um getting them out of the Java, and but actually all I see there is just JavaScript. Everything is JavaScript, so where's the Java? We're here to talk about Java, not JavaScript. We got your back, actually. So now Java people are complaining, we want those web components inside our application. Again, in our research lab, we started to experiment with some add-ons like this. So this is a screenshot taken from my, uh, our add-on directory. It's called Elements Add-on and it allows you to have a web component inside your Java application. So if you want to have these cool web components that you found out there in the web, and you want to start using it but still with Java, this add-on will be your guide. We also working in progress with that. We have some colleagues who are starting to experiment this. So they took the Elements add-on um, and implemented something similar with um, for example, date picker, it's our uh, Polymer based date picker and started to make it available as a separate add-on. Actually, today morning I was reading our blog and I noticed that my colleague, uh, Alejandro, also uh, started to do the same with the combo box. So it's now available for you as a Java developer. Okay. I feel that there's a catch somewhere in this. Actually... So, so who's going to be making this? Who's going to be updating this? Uh, let's see. You are working in a framework team, right? Yeah. Then it's you. Oh, crap. All right, so um, basically, uh, this is the result of 
uh, intensive research and work, we have been open to the community up about uh, our uh, research and our uh, uh, progressive in this progress in this. So we have a lot of uh, open source libraries and tools available on GitHub that shows what we are building. So for example, Angular to Polymer that allows you to use pretty much any Polymer component inside an Angular application. We have also uh, implemented this GWT API generator uh, that allows you to generate Java APIs for pretty much any Polymer element. We have also this uh, GWT uh, elements, Polymer elements. B basically, it's a successor of the previous e library where um, we generated elements for pretty much all the Polymer components available out there to make it accessible for Java users. Um, and, and to a response in the community, we have um, Zakaria Amin, who uh, shared with us this uh, nice application. You can go and check it out. It's fully written in Java, yet it's progressive web app. It's based on the official Google template for creating a progressive web app with Polymer. So if you happen to use Polymer CLI and create a progressive web app using their template, you can now generate it as well with Java. So what is the state right now? What is the future? How the future will look like? I think it's now clear that we can see the future is going to be a mobile web apps. We can learn from our history. We can learn from how native apps on desktop devices are almost non-existing now, except for content producer, of course. You don't want to have your IDE on the web just yet. But the same thing is happening now on mobile devices. So uh, it's moving more and more toward web. Users eventually will not be needing to install their apps uh, and go to marketplace and do all those kind of hassle. The apps will be just available in uh, whenever you visit them for the first time. Um, we have also uh, done a lot of research in our lab, so we've created this uh, nicely looking uh, application totally in Polymer. So this is a progressive web app built 100% in Polymer using Vaden elements that I just showed, and also with other Polymer elements. And if we open the source code, the HTML source code of this app, we can see clearly on the downer part that it's just a set of web components placed in the browser. But we have built this again, rewritten it totally in Angular. The theming here look a little bit different because of reasons, but it's totally the same application exactly, progressive web app built in Angular. And again, if we open the source code, we can see clearly that it's written with Angular. And that's not everything. We have rewritten the application again, but now totally in Java. The good news here is all the hacks that Temu has been doing today, we have been experimenting inside our Vaden labs, and we have been doing a lot of experiments to see how, how far we can go with this. We managed to build a progressive web app totally in Java. Unfortunately, this is still internal, not public, but I can tell you that once we feel that it's matching uh, the market and it's ready to be released, probably if you are following our blog, you will be the first to hear about it. This is, by the way, the HTML source code, and you can see clearly that it's completely different. It's generated, of course. It's uh, generated, but it's based on web components. So you can see a piece of code of web components injected in the browser. All the links mentioned today are available, open source, um, in our GitHub repository, if you just Google it, and you can see all the demos as well. If you are really interested about this Java demo that I mentioned at the end, please visit us in our booth, and we can explore more about that. As I said, it's just still an internal, um, internal research that we are doing. It's, it's there, it's doing a lot of nice things. I, I would say, as a summary, that we are there already. We are going to release this at some point of the time. 
We have you backed up if you want to use Polymer and you want to continue on JavaScript. For enterprise developers who still want to use Java for uh, their application because Java is consistent and object-oriented and widely spread, then we also got your back. You will be able to use our technology either with following the hacks that Temu did or with our next product. You will be able to have the latest trend in technology with our framework. Now, um, if this is all caught your attention, or maybe our t-shirt caught your attention, and you would like to have one of them, um, maybe you can ask me a question now. Yes, go ahead. Uh, do the Java component support Java 8 uh, language? Java component? Okay, so to repeat his question for everybody, he's asking if I'm using Vadin component, can I use Java 8? Can you answer? Well, pretty much you can. Uh, our old version, or actually the current stable version, Vadin 7, is using Java 6, but it is Java 8 compatible in the sense that we have tried to make uh, as much of the APIs Java 8 compatible as possible, and we are not limiting you from using any Java library, unless there's some kind of a conflict between dependencies and that requires some tinkering. But basically, all the features of Java 8 should be more or less directly usable with Vadin. But I hear that you are releasing Vadin 8 soon. Yeah, and Vadin 8, the uh, thing we're building right now, is actually using Java 8 and a new version of uh, the Quit. Uh, we are doing all kinds of uh, method references, fun uh, functional interfaces, lambdas all, all over the place. So you are going to learn a lot more about Java 8 in the upcoming version. Yeah, I think, I think the strategy with Vaden 8 is that we are going to drop all support for non-Java 8, previous version of Java 8. And in Vaden 7, we are still supporting Java 6 or Java 7 if you still want to use those old versions of Java. Yes. Okay, thank you. You have earned a nice reindeer. <laughs> uh, other questions? Now from the other gender, female question? No? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. What will happen if my users are using a quite old version of the browser? Uh, there will be some policy in order to work with the compatibility? Well, I can, I can tell you that at least the demos that I show right now has polyfill. Uh, but what exactly we are going to do is something that I don't have a concrete answer for. I, don't, I cannot tell exactly what is the answer for that, uh, but I can tell you that we are just measuring how much valuable it is to support old browsers versus support the vast majority of users. But what I can tell you for sure as a confident answer is uh, right now, as of Vaden 7, we are supporting till Internet Explorer 8. And that's something that will not change, at least within the next two years. And the demo that Temu, the demo that Temu, nice music, the Temu yeah. did uh, <laughs> was actually based on Vaden 7. So he got a progressive web app with Vaden 7 that can work on Internet Explorer 8. He's in tab. Yeah. Ah, thank you. More questions? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch all the questions, so... Okay, so the question here he's asking uh, is that uh, part of Progressive Web App is to have an app shell, which is a menu and sidebar and stuff like that. I've seen that in many um, templates that are generating progressive web app, but my humble answer is that no, it's not required. Maybe it's cool to have, but it's not mandatory, as far as I know. Maybe there is a change in that, but I've seen a lot of other templates that are generating uh, progressive web apps and does not necessarily have that. Right, more questions? We have the framework guy here, so it's a, a good chance to ask him uh, nice question as well. Please go ahead. How about uh, I'm sorry. 
Apple users. Uh, what about them? All right. So as long as uh, we are waiting Apple to support this in Safari, we are going to have that as well. The good news is with Safari, the latest version of Safari that has been announced a uh, few weeks ago, it started to show support for polyfill and stuff like that. It's not there yet, it's not 100% supported yet, but I believe that they eventually will do that because it's just becoming more and more viral, becoming more and more standard and important. Does that answer your question? Okay. I, I, I don't know when Apple will support that, for sure. Uh, maybe ask Steve Jobs or something. <laughs> but uh, I, I really don't know. <laughs> yeah. More questions? Yes. Um, the hacks you showed were actually some HTML and some combinations with uh, JavaScript. But uh, these are still internal, you said. Is it uh, for the next version, will it be bit more beautiful in the form of configuration that you can handle these things? Let's, or? let's, I can answer your question. So you are asking like, when, when do we, when don't we anymore need these ugly hacks, exactly. basically? And the answer is that I started working this morning for a pull request to the Vadim project that would enable these more or less automatically. Uh, basically, we want, of course, our users to have all the nice new things uh, that they want to have and apparently the progressive web apps is something that people want to build and actually since testing it for this week I do understand why because it's really easy to get it on your home screen it opens automatically from there so we have been discussing this topic a lot on this week when we are going to bring it to the framework I hope in the near future we can maybe even go so far as to provide it for the 7 version of Vardin, I don't know. I'm not giving any promises because I am not the product manager. I'm not the product owner. I cannot make these kinds of promises. But at least we need to make it easier for the users to do. Uh, we spend a lot of time figuring out all the hacks that we need to make them real small and visible changes instead of trying to like pulling all the extra features and do all kinds of modifications and do, do ugly hacks. We try to make it uh, small and simple. And in, in my opinion, this should be a framework feature automatically available for each and every single user we have. So, so uh, can I put it straight like that, that uh, we showed that it's possible. We sh I showed also that uh, there are a lot of add-ons available already to help you do that, get started. Uh, but as I said, it's an add-on. It's not like built-in feature. Having it as a built-in feature, I don't know when. It's hopefully very soon, as he said. Yeah. All right. Still more questions? OK. Is there something about the Vardin designer? What, what is he gen generating? Is Java app? Or? Uh, Vardin designer. So Vardin designer, what does it produce? Uh, the designer is a <coughs> drag and drop UI building feature that we built, a commercial one at that. And basically, it is generating a declarative HTML format that describes a set of components that is in a Vadin UI or a part, portion of a Vadin UI. Maybe, maybe you can visit his uh, quickie. He's making a quickie during lunch break and uh, coffee yeah, breaks. Yeah, I can. I can uh, there's the visit.vadin.booth.devox. Just go, go there and re-ask your question, and you will get a more in-depth answer. Yeah, you but can basically, the demo also. Basically, the designer is producing a HTML file and a Java, corresponding Java file. More questions? Yeah. Uh, TV support. TV support. Uh, that's a hard question, actually. <laughs> I Actually, it's outside of my expertise. I, I really don't know. I don't know how it works. Do you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no single idea how it works. Sorry. <laughs> if you have some awesome idea on how we could build Vardin applications for televisions, please contact us. <laughs> yeah. More questions? I.
No. No. Uh, how what in actually works? Uh, so the question was, uh, is is Java code con uh, compiled into JavaScript? And no, uh, that's not how Vadim works. The Vadim works in a way that we have our server-side component implementations. And you listen to events on the server-side. And when you add actually one of those event listeners, there's a thin client implementation that is going to handle the user input and know that you are interested in this kind of an event from this component. And it will send the information to the server. And your application code is executed on the server and not on the client. So did you have a continuation question? Um, no, then my uh, continuation <laughs> question is invalid. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Yeah, another question. Uh, how do you anticipate uh, Java 9 into the Vadim framework? Is that the responsibility of the users? Let's say that uh, the, the question, repeating, uh, was about Vadin and Java 9. So let's say that after seeing the keynote yesterday, and watching how the jigsaw works and how the model stuff is built, I think that once we get some time to go through it, we are going to make Vardin into more or less a module for Java 9. So that you could, uh, we, are try we should tr minimize the amount of uh, modules that we require and then provide a Vardin module that is going to contain all the Vardin stuff. And maybe even split that into pieces so that you can leave out subsets of your Vardin, Vardin dependencies. Does this answer your question? All right. I think we have three more minutes. So more questions? Yes. So the um, question was, uh, we rely a lot of Spring, a lot on Spring, which is not actually true. Uh, I, I happened to use it in the demo. And basically, I could have used a Java EE environment. I could have used CDI to do the component injections. I could have used any uh, Java Pure API. Java I even. could have used uh, Couchbase Java. to make my back end. I can use whatever I want with Vaden. It just happens to be so that Spring Boot and Spring Data Repositories are surprisingly easy to set up. Uh, I know at least a couple of users in the Vardin uh, user community who use Groovy with Vardin. There are some helper libraries, I think, and there are some examples available on the internet. Basically, googling uh, Vardin and Groovy, you're going to get some example code. Yeah, I guarantee you. <laughs> All right. Questions? Very interesting questions today, actually. Yeah. No more questions? Yes, finally. Uh, how Vadim can uh, make uh, an application available to those remote line nodes? Does it have the indication from client In the case of this, uh, so the question is, how can Vadin make an application offline? In this case, it happened to work because it was caching just the right things, more or less by accident. Um, <laughs> so the offline mode, if we are going to implement the uh, progressive web app features to Vardin, we are most likely going to provide a way for you to build an offline page that is in the same way as Twitter telling the user that, hey, you need to be online to actually use this. Uh, Vardin has a built-in feature um, about disconnections. So if you are online when you open your application and it's up and running, it will actually notice when your connection goes offline and reconnect. And you can actually use the application, uh, at least the current view, while the connection is down. All right, one last question. No? Over here? No? Okay. Um, that was impressive. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Temu, for uh, your coding skills. Uh, if you have more questions or if you want to see more in depth about this Java app thingy, please visit us on our booth. It's just in front of the door on the right side. Uh, thank you again for attending and enjoy the conference. <laughs>